Hello, welcome to Learning with the Cleveland Orchestra. My name is Rose Breckenridge and I'm lecturing for the Cleveland Orchestra series, Music in Depth. Today we're looking at Antonin Dvorak and his quintet for strings in G major. I'll be talking about Dvorak's life and his musical style and also I'll give you background for the string quintet in G major and do a musical tour of the piece. So, let's get started. Antonin Dvorak lived from 1841 to 1904. He was the leader of the Czech National School after Smetna. Smetna lived from 1824 to 1884. Dvorak was born in a small village near Prague where he grew up in poverty, but music was his joy. He loved music so much that his father sacrificed mightily to further his son's education, eventually sending him at age 16 to the Prague Organ School. Dvorak uh, earned a job eventually playing viola in what would become the Czech National Opera Orchestra led by Smetna. And he continued his studies at night once he was out of the Prague Organ School because he was determined to become a composer. In 1873, he married one of his music students. He took a job at, as a church organist. He resigned from the orchestra. His goal was to devote much more time to serious composition. The first years of his marriage were marked by much financial insecurity and tragedy. He and his wife lost their first three children to illness and accident. He was anguished, but he did not give up composing. In the mid-1870s, Dvorak came to the attention of the great German composer Johannes Brahms, already famous. Brahms was born in 1833 and died in 1897. He, Brahms was a judge on a government committee uh, whose job it was to award grants to talented young artists. And of course, at that time, Bohemia was still part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Brahms, impressed by Dvorak's great talent, made certain that the young composer received multiple awards, and he even recommended uh, Dvorak to his very own publisher, Simrock. And soon Dvorak's music became widely known outside of Prague. In the 1880s, Dvorak's fame spread from Bohemia to Austria to England and eventually to the United States. In 1892, he was invited to America to take over the job of directing the new National Music Conservatory in New York City. While he was in America, Dvorak was extremely homesick for his native Bohemia so homesick, in fact, that he actually spent a summer uh, uh, with a Czech community out in Spillville, Iowa. There he could speak Czech with his own people and be closer to nature for those long walks that he loved so much back in Bohemia, where he could uh, enjoy the wonderful songs of birds. Going back to New York City, uh, to his job at the conservatory, Dvorak wanted to encourage his students to look for inspiration to their own American music. He was especially impressed by the Negro spirituals that the, uh, his student Henry Burley performed for him. Burley was a tenor. And in fact, that experience of Negro spirituals worked its way into his great from the New World Symphony. In 1895, however, homesickness overcame him and he decided to return to his beloved Bohemia. He had high hopes for Czech independence and when he returned home, he turned away from composing symphonies and instead began to write more operas and tone poems based on Czech folk tales and fairy tales. Uh, and employing more Czech uh, folk music and folk dances. And he continued this until he died in 1904 at age 62 uh, from a stroke. 
Well, what about his music? Dvorak was a late bloomer. He longed to become a symphonist like his mentor, Johannes Brahms, but he struggled with the problem of how to reconcile German symphonic tradition with his beloved bohemian music and culture. He finally found his true musical style when he relented and turned for inspiration to that very folk music of his Czech peasant upbringing. And he did achieve his dream. He wrote symphonies, nine altogether, culminating with that famous one I mentioned already from the New World, written while he was in America. And he also was successful at uh, incorporating his native uh, folk music uh, into his musical style. He loved folk music. He sensed in it the desolation of all oppressed peoples. But he believed that folk music was never completely tragic. Though it may express sadness, the sadness of the harsh conditions that many common uh, folk people have to endure, in Dvorak's view, folk music always turns with courage away from melancholy to hope. And so wistful and sad songs will move on to happy folk dances. Dvorak's musical style is especially marked by his great melodic gift. His melodies are fresh, spontaneous, and abundant. He clothes those wonderful melodies, be they lyric or dramatic, with wonderful orchestral colors. And he often has the habit of surrounding his lovely melodies with garlands, literally garlands, of uh, beautiful counter melodies. We're going to see these stylistic characteristics already in the youthful string quintet in G major. He actually completed this work in 1875 as his opus 18. This was a pivotal time in Dvorak's budding career when he would soon become known outside of Prague due to the influence of that famous uh, composer Johannes Brahms. We already mentioned that. When he wrote this work, Dvorak gave it a subtitle, My People. And the purpose, it was actually written for a chamber music competition mounted by a, an organization in Prague that called themselves the Artistic Circle. And Dvorak's composition won first prize. And it was performed in March of 1875 for members of the organization. Now, you notice that the title, Quintet, not Quartet, uh, this is a, a work unusually adds a double bass to a regular string quartet scoring, and that double bass adds depth and sonority to the piece. I'll talk about that more in a moment. Originally, the work had five movements, but Dvorak dropped the uh, Andante Religioso and uh, later made it into his Nocturne for Strings, Opus 40. And in 1888, after Dvorak had become famous, Simrock actually published this G major quintet as a four movement work. And that's now the standard version but Simrock published it as Opus 77. Now Simrock's habit of publishing Dvorak's earlier works with misleading higher opus numbers did not sit well with Dvorak. He was afraid that the public would confuse his youthful works with his more mature compositions. But the publisher Simrock wanted to capitalize on Dvorak's growing fame and also his growing popularity. So a little bit more about uh, the music uh, structure and style of the string quintet in G major. Uh, as I mentioned, it unusually uses a double bass with string quartet scoring, which is two violins, viola, and cello. And that double bass gives it a fuller, more orchestral texture and makes it suitable for performance with a string orchestra. 
but it also frees up the cello because in a regular string quartet, the cello is often tasked with supporting the harmonies with the bass line. But because we have the double bass to do that, uh, this work frees the cello to make melodic contributions. And although it's an early work, remember it was written in 1875 before Dvorak was famous, the composition is still full of Dvorak's signature sunny, warm melodies arranged in very clear form with a touch of Czech folk music influence. And throughout the work, it also, besides lyric melodies, uh, it makes the use of many small, intricate rhythmic motifs that Dvorak will knit together uh, to create uh, exciting drama. So let's start our musical tour. Remember, it has four movements. Uh, the first movement, very fast, allegro con fioco, then a scherzo, then a slow third movement, and then a fast finale. So in the first movement, that uh, allegro con fioco, fast with fire, this is a very energetic sonata form in the home key of G major. It has racy and bubbling themes that use often similar short motifs uh, presented and then developed with adventure, I might add, before they're reprised and brought back in the home uh, territory there at the end of the movement. Um, the movement actually starts with a slower introduction marked with darker colors, uh, and the viola actually uh, gets to introduce uh, the first motif, but that slow darkness of the introduction will actually soon pick up speed. Here it is. This then is a kind of a transition uh, to the main body of the movement where we're going to meet the uh, main theme uh, that's going to come in and dance off literally using both triple, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three uh, motifs and duple. Dum, da, da, dum, da, da, dum, da, da, dum. So let's hear our main theme uh, introduced here, leading into it. Now the second theme uh, begins more softly uh, and is going to skip along using lots of triplets. Those are the one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three ideas. Uh, and um, even though it begins softly, it begins to eventually gain energy uh, and become as bubbly as the first theme. So here is the transition to our lighter second theme. Some uh, great material to work on in the midsection rising action of the play. Uh, I'm going to play you one little part from that midsection that takes that theme that we just heard. Uh, and um, remember, when it started out, it was quite light. Uh, but in this uh, part, 
uh, Dvorak's going to actually develop it in a very grandioso, that's how he marks the score, uh, with a very loud fortissimo uh, volume. And uh, it's quite dramatic. And eventually there's going to be not only heightened drama, but a little bit of back and forth dialogue. Uh, so this is an exciting moment uh, in the rising action of the play. Dvorak definitely had a good sense of drama. Of course, uh, we finally, at the end of the movement, bring everything back in the home key. So let's look now at the second movement, Scherzo, marked Allegri, Allegro Vivace, fast and lively. Uh, this movement's in a minor key, E minor, and it's uh, possibly the most strongly influenced in the work by Dvorak's love of Czech folk music. Uh, from his beloved Bohemia. The opening motif is marked by syncopation. That means that uh, instead of accenting on the beat, bum, 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 it's actually going to be bum, 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 bum. And it's in a jig meter, da, 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 one, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, and it's definitely a dance. So here is the opening of the scherzo with its wonderful folk like melody. The second thing, uh, pardon me, uh, the scherzo actually also has a second theme that's much sweeter uh, and it's going to uh, feel almost like rocking back and forth uh, as the music will eventually uh, begin to slip around between keys. So it gives us a foil, if you will, to that very uh, distinctive opening. Here it comes. really hear that slipping into minor there towards the end of uh, that lovely rocking, gently rocking theme. So, so far the uh, meter has been, as I said, a jig meter, one, two, three, four, five, six. Now in the center we have a very lyric trio uh, that moves away uh, from the jig rhythm uh, to a duple rhythm and also lifts things up uh, to a uh, you might say, brighter key. Um, so it sings of bright blue skies, if you will. So let's hear from uh, the center of the movement this beautiful trio. The violins come in uh, and it's just, wow, it's just so peaceful and serene. Here we go.
then of course at the end of the movement uh, we're going to return to that sprightly uh, E minor main scherzo idea, remember? <laughs> is probably one of the most beautiful in the work. Uh, it's a slow movement, Poco Andante, in the serene key of C major, and uh, we're going to find in it magical melodies of great, great beauty. The opening theme uh, starts ascending upward by steps in an even scale pattern, but then when it gets up to the higher point, he introduces that uneven dotted dun da dun long short long, and we're going to alternate back and forth uh, between the even scale patterns and the little uh, uneven rhythms. So let's hear the opening of the third movement, Poco Andante. <laughs> that even scale uh, pattern and the little dotted long short long idea and so he's actually going to give us a variant of that theme uh, to extend its beauty and you're going to notice in this presentation uh, we're going to have those counter melodies garlands of counter melodies sort of answering and calling back and forth uh, it's a lovely, lovely section. so beautiful. Uh, there's more. In the center of the movement, uh, what he does is he gives us a contrast theme that soars upward, very high upward in uh, the distant key of E major. It's presented with this kind of pulsing uh, accompaniment uh, and it reaches beautiful heights uh, with its high uh, tessitura. Oh, let's hear this lovely idea. Here it comes. Melodist Dvorak was. Uh, this uh, beautiful theme is not only lifted higher up into a distant key, but it changes the meter from uh, duple one to one to to uh, three quarter time, a kind of a lilting waltz. Uh, and it's going to continue uh, and add more dialogue uh, and counter melodies um, in typical. Dvorak fashion. Let's hear that.
well, we must leave uh, this uh, serene land of the third movement for a more energetic and buoyant finale. Uh, our finale, Allegro Asse, uh, returns to the fast tempo of the opening. And the first theme is actually a quotation in terms of pitches of the opening of that Czech-influenced uh, scherzo. But uh, Dvorak totally transforms it into a, a bubbling, racing idea, and it begins to function like a, a rondo refrain coming back again and again with contrast material in between. So let's hear the opening of our fourth movement finale. <laughs> hear the harmonic movement away. Uh, so we're leading now into our next contrast idea that begins very softly and is marked in the score sweetly dolce, uh, but as it uh, is presented, it's going to develop uh, dramatically uh, and lead to a return of the opening refrain. So let's hear uh, that uh, contrast idea. the refrain coming back there at the end. Uh, so I want to also uh, play a, a moment when um, the music is going to transition to that opening refrain yet again, but this time in a very uh, dramatic presentation in the minor key. So let's enter into the lead up. Right, here it comes. is kind of exciting uh, and dramatic and even our quieter second theme became exciting and dramatic. Uh, we are now going to have another contrasting episode uh, that is quite new and uh, is very sweet. It sings sweetly both up in the high register and in the low register, but it is going to lead to movement around uh, with some, if you will, harmonic adventures. Uh, so let's uh, hear uh, this contrasting idea. just switches moods like Quicksilver. Uh, so uh, we're eventually going to get to our refrain back in G major, but when it comes back in this point, it's going to return in a much lower register. Remember, in the beginning it was uh, quite high, um, and it's going to have echoes uh, from uh, the middle and higher register. <laughs> Wow, 
quite wonderful. Uh, and the movement goes on uh, with our refrain showing up repeatedly with the contrast material in between. But I want you to hear, uh, as our closing excerpt, uh, the very end of the movement where Dvorak adds a little bit of a coda to sort of wrap it all up uh, with great, great, joyous gusto. <laughs> such a great piece. I hope you have a chance to listen to it uh, in its entirety. My name is Rose Breckenridge. <laughs>